This is Martin Laird for the Orkney News and I'm here with Erlen Cooper and the reason we're speaking today is because there's a program that you're featured heavily in tonight about George Mackay Brown. This is the centenary year of his birth. That's right. So this is called Between the Years and Orkney Tapestry and it'll be on BBC Radio 3 on Sunday 10th of October. Um, so I suggest people give that a listen. Oh, it was such a joy to make. It was just... when we, You know when you come to Orkney and you hope that the weather's going to be fair. It was the opposite. <laughs> and I had brought uh, the producers from the BBC and classically trained violinist Daniel Pioro to the Orkneys, to, to, to the Orkney Islands, sorry. Cut that bit. <laughs> no cuts. <laughs> and... Um, just hoping for, you know, you know the weather shifts several times a day, but um, I was hoping for some fine changing light. And the, it was brutal. It was brilliantly brutal. I, we went over to Hawaii and we are, I remember at one point going, okay, we'll go down to Peter Maxwell's Bothy, mm -hmm. just, just to go down and have a gander. And parked up at, you know, Ratwick. Yeah. And, car parking spot and and braved it you know you know when the rain is so heavy it's coming at your face <laughs> it's coming from below that's so, quite a climb to get up there too yeah so, so we, we, we exactly so we, we start uh, you know plodding forward and then very quickly they form like a chain behind me <laughs> so it's like a kind of military walk like a stomp and I realise halfway down to the Rackwick Bothy itself, it's, it's you know, I, I remember hearing Daniel say, I can't feel my face, you know, I can, let alone the thought of playing <laughs> playing the violin. And so I had to think of my feet and I saw that the, the sheep were all sheltering against the north wall of the Bothy. Mm -hmm. And so I, so I shouted, everybody follow me, we're going to follow the, the same path as the sheep and I'm pretty sure we'll have just enough uh, of a drop of wind to be able to at least have a conversation for radio. So there's there's all these little moments which will sa probably sound quite tame on the radio, but the reality was it was fantastically brutal. It was one of those days, you know, when the weather it was four, three or four days and the weather shifted so quickly, changed so many times, which was brilliant, really extreme and, and fantastic. So then when we're sat at... Uh, the Broch in um, Rousey and the weather becomes almost like a, an oasis of calm and seals are popping up it was just joyful, it was great What kind of condition was uh, Max's Bothy in? Uh, well this was uh, Max's Bothy looked alright but uh, uh, this was the Bothy, you know the, the Rackwick Bothy Oh right, okay That's You know, right there, because I wanted to take them on to Rackwick Beach and we couldn't get in. Ah, I forgot to mention we couldn't get in because of the the restrictions on on um, on access. So it was locked. <laughs> so that was the other thing. I I I'd risked it all because it's a what is it? Twenty five minute half hour stomp down to the beach. But don't worry, we'll be in the <laughs> we'll be in the warm bosses. <laughs> Soon enough, we'll be able to light a fire. We can we can do our broadcast from there. We can you know we can play to our heart's content. Nope, it was locked. <laughs> That's how I for you. It sounds like a lot of my experiences there over the years. <laughs> it was great. So you were recording for the EP at the same time then, as making the documentary, is that right? Cause you... No, no. Uh, which EP? Carve the Runes and Be Content with Silence. Was that The music from that's different, is it? That's not an EP, actually. That's an album. Right. Uh, so an LP. Uh, and it's it's actually my first fully classical work so it's a concerto in three movements right it's about 33 minutes long which okay. is the length of tape and yet yeah, Daniel and I had recorded it three weeks prior well, four or five weeks prior in Glasgow with the RCS uh, with a with an ensemble he had put together and um, we recorded these 13 14 players in Glasgow I told them that you know a little bit about the the theme of what uh, it, 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 I was going to touch on 
time and collaborating with Earth itself, mm -hmm. and, and it was a kind of tip of the hat to George Mackay and and um, Margaret Tate and and Peter Maxwell, and, you know, all of, all of these greats long before before uh, before us, and um, we recorded it, and then I put it onto tape onto a uh, you know large format quarter inch tape and then deleted all the digital files so mm -hmm. there's only one copy that's an interesting move mm. it was a a, a, a a kind of manifesto of intent an intent to do it for for many many reasons which I won't bore you with per se but uh, yeah well, then we, a lot we took of, it up it brings up a lot of subjects actually but obviously I mean, we're speaking about George Mackay Brown so we should deal with that first but um, yeah an Orkney Tapestry was kind of a an inspiration for that was it? Of course, because he does speak about music and its relationship to the land, so it's it's a natural, uh, yeah, makes of course. Sense. And he, he talked about time mm -hmm. an awful lot. I thought, uh, in fact, what it beside the ocean of time, these great books. And um, I was always interested in how you how can you truly collaborate with time? Not deep time, not not kind of decades and hundreds of years. But is there a way to do it? In the modern world, where everything is so instantaneous, you know, instant grat. You you get it now, you get it tomorrow. You order it, and it's there. Especially music, which is very commodified and devalued at the moment. That's right. But I mean, recorded music's only existed for a very yeah. short space of human history. So exactly. Things are different since tape was was uh, discovered and invented. It was able to be, you know more widely reproduced and, and copied and and, and for, for, for that reason I, I thought in fact there was a I think it was a conversation Peter Maxwell was talking about when he lived at his bothy he was talking about coming off clock time I, and I, I, I got, that really stuck with me and then I thought about the concept of wild time and and I thought wouldn't it be great you know We've all just gone through a landmark moment, um, which took some time, and we're still in it. But isn't it interesting how two years feels like two months ago almost? Um, yeah, it's very subjective. It you is, and it depends what you do. We've all got a kind of fresh awareness of who we spend our time with and where we spend our time. So this constant, repeated form of time kept 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 eating away at me so this was a way to kind of um, look at value where you, you have something singular uh, look at a way to see how it changes over a process of time so I planted it or buried it, planted it here in the soil somewhere and I'll dig it up in three years and I'll, I'll, I'll be interested to see how the soil has degraded the tape and have you tried an experiment like this before i have so you have a rough idea what to expect. i've done experiments for three to eight months i mean we we were talking off off tape about uh impulse responses so you as an engineer will know that there are artifacts that tape tape creates when it ages that to some sound horrible but to me they sound quite musical mm -hmm. quite interesting and warm and textural and if you overdo it so if, it, if it's in the soil too long for example it'll, it'll overcook it in effect, effect it'll it'll disintegrate to nothing mm -hmm. uh, tape doesn't like moisture it doesn't like sunlight it doesn't like salt sea air so it's been dipped in the sea it's been uh, dried a little bit in the sun orkney sun and it's been planted in orkney soil so we'll see what it comes out. Do you think it's going to be readable? <laughs> yes, I do. And maybe that, maybe that will be 33 minutes of silence. But it won't be silent, will it? It'll be cracks and textures. Mm -hmm. It'll be really interesting. I really, you know, funny enough, I, I'm really proud of the players. They worked really hard for three days. You know, we workshopped it and then... You know, and they were making the sounds of seagulls and all sorts of things with an orchestra. And then we recorded it and put it onto the tape. 
I, nothing would please me more than to, for, for people to hear that body of work. But because I've set this manifesto, I have to, I have to stick by it. No, that's very interesting. It reminds me somewhat of uh, Bill Drummond's 17 project. Are you aware of that? I, I, I've actually uh, shared a drink with Bill. Oh, really? And um, he became ill-tempered when somebody with me said, why did you do that? <laughs> <laughs> and he, think he said something like, if you have to ask, then you, you don't deserve the answer. <laughs> I've also seen him say that he's finding some of his decisions harder to live with as time goes on. Well, I suspect that one. The, 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 the one where he burnt the money will, will no doubt stick with him for many times. But I love the idea of the 17 because it was so uncommercial. The only people who ever heard that music, for anyone who doesn't know, are the people that sang it. Mm -hmm. Which was a different 17 people wherever he went, but mm -hmm. there was no recording made. Mm -hmm. I love that. And actually, on that note, um, and this, this project wasn't inspired by Bill. No, I'm sure it wasn't, but similar sort of concepts. Yeah, I wonder if it's because we're, you know, maybe it's a Scottish thing, I don't know. We, we like to take, to do experiments and take risks and look at the world differently. Um, but, uh, yeah, I like the idea that the music exists now only in the memory of the players that made it. Mm -hmm. And on that tape somewhere on the aisles, <laughs> I think there's something quite potent about that about what we value. I was talking to a writer yesterday and he said, uh, my daughter who's 18 has gone through my, my, my uh, wardrobe. He's from Hamburg and she's just picked out some clothes of his that he used to wear in his 20s. And there's something quite uh, moving about the idea that, you know, 20 years later, someone else is wearing your jacket and that jacket was worn for decades. Mm -hmm. it's, got a, it's got a story to it. And in a world, of, as I touched on before, you know, where, where music just feels so devalued, the arts during this period of lockdown have been, haven't seemed to be that important, despite it being the most important thing. You know, we all... We all uh, we are all entertained during the day at some point by arts in some form. And, um, yeah. So I know it, a lot of musicians have really struggled. Oh, it's been, know, uh, absolutely. I, I, the whole uh, industry, I mean, all the you know, stage crew and everything, everyone yeah. involved. Yeah. I speak every day with colleagues in the industry. Some have, are retraining as teachers, some are doing all sorts of things. Um, I had many projects mothballed uh, and that's okay, and they'll all, some will come back, and some haven't made it. But I just, I'm very fortunate to have a studio, and so even without being commissioned, I'll be working. Mm -hmm. So I, you know, like a project like this, I'll just get on with it because it keeps me sane. <laughs> and and every day, I guess, because I'm not, uh, I'm not classically trained, so I study myself every day. I start very early and I write every day from kind of... Well, well I was going to ask you about your musical history because, I mean, going back to George Mackay Brown, um, music, I mean, some Arcadian families have got a, a tradition of making music together. Mm -hmm. I think this was probably true all across Scotland, but it wasn't true in my family and it seems to be a culture that's dying out, but I wondered if you came from a musical family? I'd say my siblings, and I'm one of six, I think they're all arguably better musicians than me. <laughs> <laughs> they would say so for sure. <laughs> we were uh, encouraged <laughs> to play an instrument or at least learn music. So I think I learned cornet and fiddle very badly. All I wanted to do was play piano and learn guitar. So I would borrow my father's key for the school because he's a teacher at school and I'd probably be the only kid well all my pals were playing football I was sneaking into the music room to learn how to record onto tape machines and learn how to play chords on the piano and, and, and deconstruct songs so I could learn how to produce and ultimately learn how to write um, which I still do now so I think nothing's really changed 
He also, George Mackay Brown also mentions in an Orkney tapestry that his love of the old mode of Orcadian speech, which he described as slow and laconic. And he said in the 60s when he wrote this that it was dying out. And I think there's still pockets of that surviving because I know what he's talking about. Mm. But do you think that's influenced your music? Yeah. Uh, I think actually, you know, talk, to, talking to folk like Robert McFarlane, and, uh, who, who encouraged the use of <clears throat> words that aren't, aren't dying out, but words that are, you know, were, were used in much you know, more uh, common daily use. Most of the titles of any of my Orkney repertoire, I, I always use a local dialect name. Um, that's not for now, that's for a hundred years. That's for two hundred years' time mm-hmm. when, when I'm dust and, you know, some great relative figures out that great great granddad used to make music. Um, what does that word mean? What does glimro mean? Glimro? Oh, it means to glimmer or phosphorescent or merry dancers. What's a merry dancer? Oh, it's the, it's the northern lights. So it makes you, you know, keep it, keeping the language alive uh, in song for me uh, um, by titles is, is quite a fun way to do it. I was driving at not just the words though, but also the, the mode of speech because your music is quite meditative and ambient, I would say. And we're talking about a, a slow way mm. of speaking, which doesn't imply slow with it. It's just, mm. just thoughtful and calm. Apologies, I, th- I, 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 I immediately went to dialect words, but yes, the the, the slow mood. Uh, I I think uh, I think all sorts of dialects sing. Anyway, I think I find them very interesting, but we all know that. An Orcadian dialect truly sings, and it links back to Norway and all of that. Mm. But this slow mode, um, I wouldn't say it has inspired me directly, um, but uh, I find it I find it interesting that um, you touched on the ambient side and the slower pace of things. Yeah, no, it, 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 it's, it's something I'll explore for sure. Other uh, quite a lot of other field recordings and whatnot from the forties, fifties. I suspect there are. Mm, that's a good somewhere. question. I'm not sure. I have looked for some in the past, and you run into a wall at some point where some things haven't been recorded. But I don't know. You'd have to do a deep dive. I spoke to Anne Marwick, who uh, who has got. Her, got a big archive of recordings and she did a great body of work and stories and interviews and it would be wonderful um, if her work could could go into the Scottish archive that would be a great joy and then it would be accessible Mm -hmm. we had talked about it very briefly and it's a big 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 undertaking but I'm I'm hopeful that would happen one day Um, I was really honoured to because I, I used one or two of her uh, field recordings or interviews across one of my songs on one of these records and she came to a performance and met me after and uh, I had tried to seek permission I'd left voice message after voice message anyway she comes up to me at the end of the show and says hello I'm Anne Marwick and I thought oh goodness I hope I... <laughs> and I said Anne I've stolen your work," <laughs> she said. And she said, "I absolutely loved it. It was fantastic." And I said, "I've left voicemail after voicemail on your house phone in in Stromness." And she said, "I don't live in Stromness, so whoever I've been leaving voice messages." Oh, well, at least she was happy. <laughs> we then we later met properly, and I interviewed her. And her voice then was on one of the recordings, which is, is a lovely period of full circle. Um, so maybe in some of her uh, field recordings, I may have I may have heard this slower slower pace of dialect, uh, and and absolutely that would have in, inspired me. There's a song called Catty Face, where it opens with a, a gentleman talking about his. Um, he, he he found a, a short-eared owl 
and he talks about taming it and feeding it and it kind of opens this work and then the song lilts along at the same pace as his as his dialect, as his story. So I suppose it does. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you about um, how you draw inspiration from George Mackay Brown specifically because his poetry is very vivid and evocative, quite apocalyptic in places. Um, but you've obviously chosen the Nordic Tapestry to be, well, that's this influence on this programme that's coming out and the music in that. So and ta- we've talked about the subjects mm. that he deals with and some of the themes, but practically, what influence did it have on you? You mean the book? or do you Yeah, mean the, the book. I, I, I'm very fond of his collected poetry works, actually. Mm-hmm. Uh, I find it... George's work in particular, I enjoy opening a, a collection of poems at any page and taking my time to read that poem a little bit slower. Um, uh, and actually, I was talking to someone the other day and I said that I'm less inspired by composers and musicians. I'm more inspired by writers, poets, Painters like Norman Aykroyd, directors like Sally Potter, poets like George Mackay, and, and uh, well, that I, makes sense to me because you're translating it to a different medium yeah. in a way. So it's not like appropriating music because you then you would risk copying people or yeah. unconsciously or consciously. Mm-hmm. But I suppose there's a translation process. It's just an influence. I, I think, think so. I, I I think as well that. I'm, I'm interested in people and conversations, and um, there's, I'm, I'm discovering that there's, 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 a, there's a common thread of creative thought across all the mediums of, of the arts, and it often links to simplicity. You know, this thing that looks so simple and so obvious, whether it's a, a structure, an architect's structure of a building, or a and then, and then as you've shown me a, a print by your father which I'm, I'm very taken by and uh, there's the simplicity of, of what it is which is so deeply complex that the more you go into it and to get something simple is incredibly hard George would write I think someone else had said with the precision of a surgeon you know he would edit and cut and I think what I'm discovering is so much of the creative process is in the edit. There is no... I'm finding that for me, as a, as a writer of music, that um, composing is more like writing or editing a book, where 90% goes, you cull it, chop, 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 and you throw it on the cutting room floor like a film director would, and then you're left with the 10%, which, as George or others would say, is the essence of, of, of what it is you're trying to say, leaving room for the reader or the listener to interpret it as they want mm-hmm. and dig a little deeper. Um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm meandering a bit, but I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested in our relationship with the outside world and often the people that inspire me write about a relationship with the outside world, whether it's strongest community's relationship with the sea, for example. You know, when George says sea pink, I know exactly what he's what he's describing. We've all seen it, you know, when it just hovers above the above the harbour. It's a fantastic you know, one minute it's blue and then there's this little sea pink and mm-hmm. yeah, he just described things so evocatively. Yeah. He had a deep love of the past and of history as well. Yeah. And uh, possibly could be accused of reeling against modernity to some extent. Mm-hmm. Well, certainly, I mean, it wasn't I mean, uranium mining and nuclear war and stuff mm-hmm. like that. He was very much opposed to, but other parts of modernity as well, maybe. Is that something that you agree with? Parts of it, yeah, for sure. I mean, it's. Uh, I. You've transferred your music to an analog tape, for example, yeah. which was recorded digitally. Yeah, so, that, I mean, exactly. So you obviously do embrace digital technology. I work uh, in a hybrid form. Right. 
intentionally so. I mean, I'm, I'm a product of that generation with a great respect of the origins of it. And I think this is missing. The respect for the origins are going or have gone. Understanding when you're recording on your Tascam here on a DR700 and I think about a Tascam, you know, uh, Porter Studio, Porter 2. And I think, wow, you know, the tape heads and the delete head and the erase head and the, you know, like just understanding and respecting just how incredible that device you have on your table is, but where it's come from. And its limitations, though, because you couldn't take an SD card out of that and bury that. Well, you could, but you probably wouldn't get much out of it. Exactly. Digital artifacts, if anything. But it wouldn't have the same effect. Exactly. And and my father said it something the other day, which I think, again, stuck with me in in my mind's eye. He said, one day, you know, we're all just, you know, you'll go to get your photos, you go to look through your photos of nine and a half thousand or whatever you've got for one year and it'll just be digital soup there will be no you, you, unless you archive yourself or you have somewhere you know it's, it's in the cloud mm-hmm. where in, in uh, Poland where, where is your cloud you know where, where is it based and, and uh, if you're not careful you'll, you'll just have a big wash of digital soup which is the same risk that you used to have the same fear of your house burning down and losing your photos. And that preciousness, you think, oh. Yeah, you need to make prints, I think, though. And I think we had a conversation about encouraging folk to maybe annually print off some pictures or at least print them and put, you know, put them on your wall. For me, audio is quite similar. I think about it uh, like that sometimes. You know, it can be digitally reproduced and copied. It, I was speaking to the writer yesterday and he's a huge collector of music and he was talking to Brian Eno and uh, he was talking to Brian about uh, an ambient record in the 70s that Brian discarded he, he said by the time I'd finished it I uh, I wasn't happy with it I'd I'd, uh, I'd over overcooked it you know he'd overthought it it mm-hmm. became heavy Never thought about it until the interview with the, with with um, Christoph, and Christoph said, "I have a copy." And Eno stopped. He said, "What? Said, I have, I have a bootleg copy. It made it into the bootleg archives of this obscure forum that loves your work as an ambient composer." And he, Brian, was mortified and overjoyed in equal measure and was reintroduced to his album that he had all but thrown away in the digital form. The digital form had saved it. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. And he released it, I think, three, four years ago. So not only... There's multiple stories in that, but the the, the main one being, well, fantastic, it was saved. Uh, well, Brian, you know, is another very interesting creative character and obviously a pioneer in ambient music as well. So would you say he's been an influence on your work? Yes. Um, I, I actually think more in the way he thinks as a person. To use an example, he will uh, create a tension in a room. You know, say he's working with a huge star. He'll put some... Local community choir that he's just set up from the pub and the butcher, and he'll put them in the corner, and he'll create an attention where that big star has to think on their feet and think differently. I like the way he approaches he, uh, his work. Uh, I like the way he self-imposes limits and manifestos mm-hmm. because they're there to be broken by only the person who sets them in place, which is what I try to do. Um, I really like the idea of the oblique strategy cards. Yes. You're stuck, just pull yeah. one out and see what happens. With Peter Schmidt, yeah, I, I, have, I have several copies of those. I have them on my speakers in my studio. Uh, and it's often other people that come in and, and leaf through them, but I, occasionally I, I'll, I'll pull three out and, and laugh at how relatable they are and completely obscure they are to what I'm doing at that moment. Um, 
Yeah, I, I, uh, I, I, um, I, li- I like his, his. He's got. He's clearly got a, a brilliant intellect and brain. Yeah, he's uh, a good speaker. Worth listening to. He is. Yeah, he is. Well, we should maybe move on because you've got a film coming out soon as well that you've done the soundtrack for, which you've made in collaboration with Alex Kozobolis mm-hmm. and Catherine Joseph. So, do you want to tell us a little bit about that? I mispronounced Alex's surname so many times on our first visit to Orney. It's Kozobolis, right? And I spent the whole week calling his name wrong, and um, we've now become the closest of friends and collaborators. And we only met each other four years ago, but but made a record every year, every year. And he's taken hundreds of pictures. His pictures adorn my studio walls. Um, and uh, when it comes to film, oh, I'm convinced he'll win a BAFTA one day. I'm sure of it. Not that that means a job to him. I watched the trailer, but it doesn't give much away about what the film's actually about. It's it it's uh, it's about nothing and everything. It's about finding... Actually, it's a nod to Margaret Tate. We it, should say it's called Never Pass Into Nothingness as well. Which is... Um, uh, it's um, a, um, a poem by John Keats. And it's a passage of the poem. And actually, all it is about... And it was shot in the middle of lockdown, in the middle of a city. It's about finding the natural world in an urban environment... But it's also just about finding a little bit of magic in the everyday. That's it. Something which George and, and Margaret would would do mm-hmm. constantly. Um, but here I am, stuck in a city, thinking... And it was the most miserable of days, spitting, horrid. And uh, the rainwater was lashing and bouncing off concrete. Yet I think Alex has produced one of the most beautiful short... Uh, it's really a long form music video rather than a short film. Right. So it's either a short film or a long form video. You know, it's twenty minutes long. But really we went into it with nothing. So just the idea of okay, we're here in the city at this point, the Roman Wall, the Barbican in London, and we shall walk around for a few hours. I'll write a score as we go. I'll, I'll go back that evening and write a theme. And so really the idea was that a film would present itself and a theme would, de- would develop. And so the score develops a theme by the very end. So all this, all these little uh, fragments come together. And the only thing I had was a tape loop. Funnily enough, I would bought a Nagra machine on eBay and it had a tape on it. And I... I, I, I played the tape and it was at the wrong speed and it had this fantastic tone so I had something I had a tone found on a random tape on a nag machine I found on the internet (laughs) so I had something and then by the end we spotted a kestrel we found a bird hide in a city and we had a theme and so that's all it is so presumably London was a lot quieter than usual because of the lockdown though that would have helped Exactly, yeah. That was the idea, really, was to, to see what was around you. Are you concerned about copyright or somebody tracking you down who made that tape? Or is that something that worries you? Not at all. Not at all. I would celebrate it. And um, I think I've even got in touch with them to say, what on earth was on that tape? And the response was, have a clue. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you've done your due diligence. Or... It's only a snippet. And anyway, it loops and builds. Mm-hmm. I think Eno would like that. I think, again, it's this idea of, of putting yourself into uh, a mode where anything can happen, but you've got some control, some parameters. I realise now, and I'm only really starting to realise it, that my music, I think, is about tension and release. And that kind of chaos in the middle, that, that bit where it's oh, what's happening, I don't know which way it's going to go. And I think that's the field I'm ploughing. Is that not what all music's about? Maybe. Is it? I don't know. I've heard other people say that, though. So. Oh, really? Well, then, where we go? I suppose it's that kind of feeling of... Well, for me, uh, uh, it's it's about... Um, I Let's say I'm in the city for four, four weeks, four months. 
getting more and more tense and more and more anxious and you know traveling around in a compact environment with other humans coming back to my studio and then trying to have the same release of tension that you have when you make a cup of tea that's all so, so what was uh, Catherine Joseph's involvement in the film she narrates the poem right yeah so she's got a fantastic voice which I think is uh she can <laughs> she could read the dictionary and, and make it sound really interesting but I just put the words in front of her without context and she she tends to just read them in a way that's uh, interesting to my ear the frequencies of her voice I find fascinating where's the film going to be released that's the question not sure yet I think we're going to play it at the Barbican um or maybe we'll just stream it straight off one of our sites. Mm -hmm. I'll find out next week on Tuesday. There's an EP that accompanies it, so that will be on all the. And that's out on the fifteenth, I believe. Yeah. Right? When there's one song available now. Yeah. I quite. I think that's quite amusing. There's a. They, they were calling it a single. It could not be further away from being a single. Have you heard it? It's like this long ambient tone. <laughs> I'm interested who else talks about tension and release. I want to, I want to follow that up. Can well, I heard an interview on? with Lindsay Buckingham recently and he mentioned something like that about every chorus has to be like a release that the song's been building up to. That makes sense. Oh, you mean specifically within the composition itself? Yeah. For me, it's actually just the process. <laughs> of like, For me, you're getting to the point of being able to write something that responds back to me. I was misquoted recently. So I, 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 so it was quoted as, if it moves me to tears, I, 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 I've uh, achieved what I wanted. I didn't say that. So what did you mean you want to correct the record? It was clickbait <laughs> by The Guardian. I actually said, uh, if it, and I'd stolen it from Leonard Cohen, or Patti Smith, one of the two, can't remember. And I'd said, if it moves me close to the point of tears, I think I've come close to what I'm trying to achieve. Not, if it moves me to tears, I've achieved what I've wanted. That's something different. Uh, you know, I, I, I like to leave some room for interpretation. I don't want to be crying all over the piano. You know? <laughs> but when I do get to that point where that you have that tension in between uh, what we were talking about then that's, that's the bit I'm trying to get to yeah okay but I think I borrowed that from Patty Smith well you've got some live performances coming up as well yeah presumably the first in a while is that right is it well no I played uh, I played the Edinburgh International Festival which was after not playing for, for, for some time was a was, uh, quite a euphoric experience for all the musicians as, as well as uh, us you know as well as me and the team and everybody and I remember the audience um, they started stomping their feet at the end and uh, it sounded like thunder to me at the same frequency response so I said do it again <laughs> and like, do, 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 do. so it was this kind of primal feeling um, but yeah next week we go we just do a very short tour I think it was a tour that had had been mothballed due to, to, to COVID, and so now it's able to, to perform. So I'll just play uh, various bits from the three albums. And you're collaborating with a Japanese musician called Hinako Omori, is that right? She is opening up the ferry, the, the ferry of performance but each night. Hinako's brilliant. She's a, she, she uh, too works with field recordings, and, a, and a, her approach, she uses synthesizers and field recordings and her voice when she manipulates it live so I'm looking forward to hearing that yeah she actually worked she played on one of on my last record she played since as a guest so it felt very fitting for her to come and open the show as it were um, but we're not doing many shows so just five mm -hmm. and then I'll retire that ship for a bit and move on to Pastors New do you know what's coming after that yes okay <laughs>
<laughs> but that's why we're here in the town hall is to rehearse and wake up my fingers ready for tour next, <laughs> next well, week. Well, speaking of which, we were going to leave the recorder running and record a little bit of music, if you're happy with that. Sure, we can, we can give it a go. Okay, well, thanks for speaking to me. Pleasure. <laughs>